Welcome everybody today to this eighth episode of The Green Left Show. Uh, I'm Alex Bainbridge. Today we're going to be discussing the rule of law. This is a word, a phrase that has been on the lips of many people since uh, federal front benches have been using it to try and dodge accountability for Christian Porter about the allegations of rape that he has faced uh, from many decades ago. I would like to acknowledge at the outset that we are meeting, or at least we're recording this show, on stolen Aboriginal land. Uh, I'm coming to you from Jagera Turbul country, and I think it's important that we recognise that this sovereignty was never ceded. There is an un there's an injustice at the heart of, of, of Australian society, and none of us can ever be free until that injustice has been resolved. I'd also like to just mention at the beginning that uh, if, if you like the work that we do, the best way you can support Green Eft is actually literally to become a supporter. Uh, plans start from $5 a month. The first month is free. There's a link in the description below. It makes a really huge difference if you're able to help us out in that way. And I will also mention that this is the, we're still celebrating the 30th anniversary of Green Eft. We have a special anniversary celebration coming up next uh, week, Saturday 27th of March. And again, there's a link in the description if you want, um, if you want to uh, come along and be part of that. We're here today with uh, very distinguished guests. Firstly, I've got Jocelyn Scutt, uh, is a barrister and human rights lawyer, a senior teaching fellow at the University of Buckingham, and she's also a Cambridge Shire counsellor. She also has Australian experience in Australia. She was formerly the, uh, the anti-discrimination commissioner in Tasmania, among a number of other aspects in her career. I'm also here with Kamala Emanuel, a longtime feminist and social science member. So today we're going to be talking about the rule of law, since this phrase has been used by federal front benches to try and dodge accountability for Christian Porter, the Attorney General who has been accused of, of rape many years ago. Uh, I think a lot of us have this sort of vague concept that the rule of law is a good thing. Um, that's basically what means that none of us can be thrown away and locked up in detention just because the king doesn't like our hair colour or, you know, or for any other arbitrary reason. In that sense, the rule of law is a good thing. On the other hand, as I've often said, justice is a lot more important than legality. There are many examples, including uh, slavery, uh, dis disenfranchisement of women, uh, you know, uh, many other aspects, apartheid South Africa. There are many examples of things that are completely legal, but absolutely unjust. So just talking about the rule of law is not enough. So I want to just, uh, uh, let's, let's get into the discussion. I'd like to turn to you first, Jocelyn. Can you please talk to us, tell us, explain to us what is the rule of law and, and how, how can progressive people think about this issue? Um, well, thank you very much, Alex, and it really is wonderful to be able to speak with you. Um, I'm actually sitting in the land that was the original thieves in terms of the stolen land in Australia. I'm sitting here in Cambridge in England. But as to the rule of law, uh, the a principal proponent, one who, a judge who set the rule of law out in really clear terms was Lord Bingham, a judge here in the United Kingdom. And he set down eight principles. First, that the law must be accessible and so far as possible, be intelligible, clear and predictable. Two, questions of legal right and liability should ordinarily be resolved by application of the law and not by the exercise of discretion. Three, the law should apply equally to all, except to the extent that objective differences justify differentiation. Four, the law must afford adequate protection of human rights. Five, Means must be provided for resolving uh, civil disputes that are bona fide, which the parties themselves cannot resolve. And six, ministers and public officers at all levels must exercise the powers conferred on them reasonably, in good faith, for the purpose for which the powers were conferred and without exceeding the limits of such powers. Seven, judicial and other adjudicative procedures must be fair, and independent, and eight, there must be compliance by the state with its international law obligations. And if we think about situations that can arise in government, and I'm not speaking about any specific case, what we would see is that if matters do arise where, say, a public official 
is um, accused of having engaged in some activity that might be viewed as criminal or as um, unfitting of somebody in public office, then I think the principles that seem to me um, to apply are that questions of legal right and liability should be resolved by application of the law and not by exercise of discretion. So one would say, I think on that, that a, senior, a, a prime minister, for example, shouldn't simply exercise discretion and say, I'm not going to um, allow an inquiry to take place the inquiry were proposed, um, the law should apply equally to all. Well, if it's a circumstance where there might be an inquiry into the activity of some public official, then all public officials in similar circumstances should be, um, should have the law applied. And there needs to be adequate protection of human rights. One might say that human rights are not infringed by having at holding an inquiry that is one that is open to public view, that is run in accordance with due process and um, those principles of non-biased tribunal, etc. Um, and then judicial and other adjudicative procedures must be fair. Well, as long as an inquiry was run in accordance with fair, fairness and independence, then I think that that should really apply. So it does seem odd to me in some in particular circumstances, speaking in no, no circumstance in particular, but where it was said that the rule of law uh, would be breached by holding a public independent inquiry that was fair, uh, to say that that's breaching the law, uh, rule of law seems to me to be contradicting the rule of law. Do you want to make any general comments, uh, Jocelyn, about how you think Western governments like Britain and Australia, how closely do they adhere to the rule of law? And I guess I'm thinking about the, um, you know, the, the areas where, where government processes sometimes fall short. <laughs> I think, I mean, if, if you look at Australia, um, the issue, say the, the inquiry into banking, it was clear that there were problems with banking. And this has been clear from the 1980s. I mean, I appeared in many cases with clients who had been treated unfairly by banks and other financial providers. And it was really clear. There are rules about unconscionability in terms of um, bringing people into financial transactions such as guarantees and mortgages and where these are not explained properly to them then of course one can make an argument that the conduct of the bank or the finance provider has been unconscionable and yet in Australia the government was dragged in colloquial terms, kicking and screaming into that inquiry into the banks, whereas they should have said immediately, this is a matter of public concern. It is a matter where there are many cases going through the courts where the banks ha are alleged to have acted improperly, unconscionably, and many cases that have gone through the courts where that has been determined by the courts, and therefore it is appropriate to have a public inquiry but as I say, it took a very long time for the federal government of Australia to accede to that. And uh, in this country, in the United Kingdom, there are allegations that contracts in relation to the coronavirus, um, personal protective gear, for example, have been let uh, without the proper procedures being followed and yet there's no inquiry and there's been a notion that there shouldn't be an inquiry on the part of the government. Well, th those two instances seem to me instances quite clearly where governments are not adhering to the rule of law, where they're in fact ignoring it and ignoring it blatantly until, as I said, in Australia, eventually the government was pushed into having that inquiry. Then, of course, one has the inquiry, the government has the inquiry, and what happens to it? Is anything done with the outcome, with the, re with the results? And that also is not consistent with the rule of law to hold an inquiry and then to simply ignore the, the, um, the recommendations.
So the reason why the Australian Federal Front Bench is so enthusiastic supporters of the rule of law over the last two weeks is that um, they wanted to try and shield Christian Porter from any federal, from any sort of inquiry. I understand, Jocelyn, you don't want to speak about the specifics of that case. So I'm going to turn to Kamala because I, I want to ask you about what your thoughts are about the hypocrisy of this uh, passionate defence of the rule of law, especially in relation to how it's breached in relation to refugees, uh, Witness K and others. Kamala, do you have any comments about that, plus the rule of law more generally? Yeah, I do. So I, I think hypocrisy is, the, is really the thing that, that does leap out um, at me it, because there are so many instances where, yeah, it would be really good to have the rule of law. It would be really good to have the Australian government um, subscribe to the rule of law and practice it. Um, I, I would love to have seen, um, at the time when Australia joined the war of aggression against Iraq um, and the United Nations didn't initially sanction it, um, I, I would love to have seen the rule of law be applied that says you don't wage wars of aggression. Um, and still to this day, John Howard, everyone in the government who supported that war of aggression, and it continues today, um, none of them have been charged or convicted or you know held to account um, in any significant, meaningful way. Um, there, then it's also against international law to kill civilians in a theatre of war. Uh, when this has recently been exposed, the best the government could come up with was bleating about China being mean to them in a tweet. And, you know, I know some of these things are now going to go to court and, and hopefully there will be um, there will be some prosecutions. But the idea that it's only going to be prosecutions of the people down the lowest uh, rungs of um, rank in, in the military, rather than those who ordered them, um, those who turned a blind eye or encouraged acts potentially. I mean, I, I don't know who's at the top of all this, but I, you know, are they going to face justice? Um, and when you wage a war of aggression, that in itself, as I said, is um, is its own crime. So, so it's no surprise when um, other war crimes follow. Um, then it's against international law um, and Australian law to to have there be you know um, arbitrary detention and torture. Um, Australia's great friend, <laughs> uh, the United States, carries out, according to their own accounts, torture at Guantanamo naval base. Uh, and when has Australia ever criticised that, or, or when has it called into question Australia's um, military partnership? With, with this perpetrator of, of abuse. And there's other many other um, regimes around the world that Australia is happy to ignore their breaches of the rule of law. But even just on, on the question of arrest and torture, uh, arbitrary detention and torture in Australia, well, what about Australia's black sites of, of refugee detention that are offshore so they can be hidden from scrutiny and uh, yeah, it's deliberately set up. I think it's totally clear it's deliberately set up so that they're not exactly Australia's responsibility, not exactly the responsibility of the country where they're hosted, and there's this kind of not really plausible but notionally plausible denial of responsibility uh, when violations of human rights, starting with arbitrary detention but following through to as far as denial of medical care, death and just the, just the torture of the mental torture of and torment of not knowing when you're ever going to be free. Um, the um, the refugee convention um, insists that the mode of travel to um, to a country seeking uh, asylum is uh, no crime. It's not uh, can't be used to prevent the recognition and protection of refugees. But you know we breach that every single day, and we've been breaching that every single day for um, too many decades. Uh, so, I mean, they're just some of the things that just leap to mind for, you know, jot jotting down a few points um, just briefly. And I think the one that really leaps out is that there's a thing about, in the law, prohibiting rape. Uh, but the figures on the prevalence of rape and sexual assault, and conversely on the successful prosecution of uh, perpetrators who have committed rape or other forms of assault and harassment, they show that we're about as far from the rule of law as you can imagine. And so I think it's a really big kick in the guts to women in Australia to hold up the rule of law uh, spuriously um, on the one hand and so patently, blatantly fail to uphold the, the rule of law that affects so many of us. 
Um, other one other little thing that I wanted to to comment on, um, just about the specific situation that we've been experiencing in the last couple of weeks since Christian Porter's uh, media conference, um, was how it's it is pretty laughable to suppose that the rule of law would be breached by his just stepping aside. I mean, that's that's completely laughable and a lot of people have debunked it in, in various ways. And the fact that the front benches, and probably back benches, I don't really know, but certainly front benches, could all come out time after time, even after it had been debunked, repeating this as though they'd never heard anyone say, oh, but wait, what do you mean the rule of law would be under threat? And they just keep on, time after time, using this expression. And I think the question of political accountability gets raised by that. Well, if the media can't hold them to account, and many people have definitely tried, well, what sort of accountability have we got? Did you have any comments you wanted to make about that, Jocelyn? Well, I, I suppose that one of the basic principles of um, government in a free and democratic society is that the people should be able to have trust in a government. Now, we operate on the basis that when the public loses trust in a government, then we go to the polls and can vote the government out. And that is one way of affecting that. But at the same time, a government is in power for however many years the term generally is. And they have to take their responsibilities seriously and not simply say, well, we can run things as we want to and then um, put, uh, put ourselves, put ourselves to, the, to the vote and therefore we're complying with the principles of a free and democratic society. But I'm afraid it actually really doesn't work that way. The government should uh, be able to hold the confidence of the people throughout its term and that is hold the confidence of all the people um, and I'm not meaning in in party political terms I'm talking about in general terms as Kam Kam Kamala has has expressed that uh, if a government isn't acting in a way that people can have confidence in their conduct, then they really should bring themselves to account and consider what it is that they're doing and how they might change their, their conduct. And there are so many instances, I think, in the government in Australia, in the government in this country, the United Kingdom, and then in the way that things were being run in the United States under the former the 45th president of that country, where the people were in, and are in a position of being governed in ways where one has to say they are, they're, they're questionable. And I think that uh, governments do need to take their responsibilities seriously. I mean, for example, the march of women around Australia, there were thousands and thousands of women marching. Now, when women march, they're not marching for nothing. They're marching on an issue that they take seriously and that all men should take seriously and that government should take seriously. And when I say governments, I mean all the governments around Australia, the state governments and the federal government. But what does the, prime, the deputy prime minister says, I'm too busy, can't come out and talk with you. And the prime minister says, well, you'll have to come in and talk with me. And the women were perfectly right in saying, you, the prime minister, have a responsibility to us, the women of Australia, and you, the Prime Minister, should be out here on the steps talk, speaking with us. But no, the man's cowering away in his office, absolutely frightened out of his wits, too scared to come out and face his responsibility in actually addressing women, the women of Australia who were there in front of Parliament House and the women who were watching or marching in agreement all around Australia. <laughs> and the man presents himself as if, um, well, you know, he has to actually find out from his wife that rape is an appalling, is appalling conduct and rape is something that is really um, a, a blight on our community. But no, he doesn't actually know that. He has to find out from his wife. It's ridiculous and it's appalling that Australia should have a prime minister who actually does not know until his wife tells him 
how shocking and how destructive and how denying of a human right to exist in the world as a human being who is not um whose whose uh, psychic energy and whose physical um person it can maintain itself without being infringed it's, uh, it's astounding to me absolutely astonishing but then we're living in the 2021 and i suppose that that's our prime minister uh on the same day that more than 100,000 people marched around australia uh, women and supporters marching against uh, sexual violence Christian Porter announced that he was going to bring out a defamation uh, proceedings against the ABC and uh, Louise Milligan uh, for the for the report that um, that they gave. This is the unnamed report where the, he wasn't actually named as the perpetrator. Uh, I wonder. I mean, it, it strikes me that's a very limited case to to be judging uh, judging. Whereas Porter and other front benchers are basically saying this is going to determine the, the truth or or otherwise of, of the allegations that have been raised against Porter. Um, it does bring up the question about defamation law in general. I'm wondering if Jocelyn, if you uh, have got any comments about, uh, about you know, what, do progress, what should progressive people say about defamation law uh, in general? And I guess, uh, to what extent is it a, is it a suitable mechanism to, uh, to, to evaluate questions like this one? Uh, the problem with defamation law, I mean, there are many problems and they are recognised, but it's actually, uh, it's based in notions of superior power and status and so on. Let me just go back really briefly in historical terms. Defamation is traditionally about reputation, but it's about the reputation of important people, of powerful people. If it's some labourer down the street, um, the, the, the traditionally there would have been a notion that they don't have a reputation to protect. It's only important people who have reputations, but also they wouldn't have the money to launch a defamation action. That's number one. Number two, traditionally, in regard to women's rights, uh, a woman w was able to sue for defamation because her sexual status has been drawn into question. If she'd been called a prostitute, for example, or a whore, but uh, she didn't have a reputation apart from her sexual existence and so it was sexist as well defamation or definitely sexist and there's still remnants of that in the law um just quickly on the point and i won't say anything further on the porter case but uh, in uh, apart from this point uh, people have said that if a if a a report does not name somebody, then it isn't. It can't be seen as defamatory of an unnamed person. There's a really good case on this. It's a Northern Territory case where women had said that Indigenous Australian women were being raped by Northern Territory police, and some members of the Northern Territory police force issued defamation proceedings. And the determination there was that there were so many northern territory police that it really was um not an actionable defamation case because there were too many to actually identify any as those about whom the publication uh, to whom the publication related now in an instance where there are only a few people who could possibly be identified then not naming the person this is just my view in not naming the person is not a reason for saying that the defamation action is somehow therefore not properly founded but that's all i'll say about the porter case but in relation to defamation generally it has been held by australia the australian high court that because it's an issue of free speech. Defamation is a, 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 how can I put it, it's a stopper on free speech. And what the Australian High Court has said is that although free speech is not specifically referred to in the Constitution, in a free and democratic society, there must be an implied right of political speech in the constitution and there have been a number of cases on that one where a, a minister of the crown was alleged to have been using his role as immigration minister um for um you know in in uh, allegedly 
as a money-making enterprise, and that was held to be political speech because it was about um, it, it, it was a free speech in the context of Australia being a free and democratic society and therefore not defamatory. In another one, Stephen's case, there were a number of members of parliament who went on a trip overseas and were alleged to have acted in a profligate manner and uh, should not have gone and uh, the money was being spent poorly, etc. And it was held that that was political of speech and uh, and therefore it was not defamatory it could be could be said in a free and equal society and then the famous case is longy david longy who was the prime minister of aotearoa new zealand and there the allegation was that the labor party of aotearoa new zealand when in government had come to be improperly under the influence of large business interests, um, such as those who were making large donations to the Labor Party campaign funds. And David Longy was the Prime Minister at that time. And it was held, it was said that he had permitted big business donors to dictate government policy. He'd allowed public assets to be sold to some of those donors in repayment for their donations. He'd abused and was unfit to hold public office. He'd permitted a debt incurred by his party in the election campaign to be written off by awarding a government contract to a creditor and that he was corrupt and deceitful and that he'd accepted gifts of shares and profits on share trading from a leading business figure and had permitted that figure to set up a share trading account on his behalf. Now, when you look at all those cases, they're all about effectively about business and about money and about people in office allegedly abusing office in relation to monetary matters. That's what those cases have been about. I was actually thinking about the Profumo case in the United Kingdom, which was, I think it was in the 1960s. And uh, Pro John Profumo was the Minister for Defence at the time, time. And it was alleged that he had had an affair with Christine Keeler, who allegedly at the same time was having an affair with a Russian attaché who was alleged to be a spy. And um, he said in Parliament that it was untrue. Now, it, what, it did turn out to be true, and he eventually resigned. But I was thinking that if that, if that had been published and he'd taken a defamation case, which way would the court have gone? Because would it have been seen as political speech? Because whenever anything sexual arises, there's this notion that it's about private life. Now, in that case, um, I think it, it would have been seen certainly as a free, free speech should have been, that the report should have been able to be made and would not be um, defamatory because of the role he had as defence minister and the sexual matter went directly to his role as defence minister. But the point I'm making is that as soon as sex comes into anything or something matters sexual, then there can be an implication that it's about private life and therefore it's not a matter of public, of, of uh, political speech. Uh, and um, I think I think it's an interesting question. And in saying this, I'm not saying anything about current matters before the court, because of course one's precluded from doing that. I'm referring specifically in this instance to the John Profumo matter, because my mind went to that one to think, how would that have been dealt with in defamation terms? This week we've seen a New South Wales police representative uh, make the ridiculous claim that there could be a consent app and I mean, there are many reasons why I think that's a silly suggestion. But I think one thing, one thing about it is that it, there is no way you could imagine this would be used other than as a defence for the perpetrator. And so, Kamala, I'm wondering if you've got some comments about that. And I guess particularly in relation to how this uh, relates to, to the defamation case, like to what extent is this a defence of a perpetrator, alleged perpetrator? Um, and, and what does that, uh, you know, what does that mean? I guess we'll, that'll be the introduction to our discussion about um, how the legal system should uh, uh, deal with these questions of crimes of sexual assault. 
All right. Well, just to start with the app, um, I had a, I was watching a segment of the media release, a media conference when it was um, put out there. I don't know if it was just a thought bubble that was clearly just a brain fart or, or how well thought out it, it was. But the words they used were something along the lines of, and we find that the law isn't very good for perpetrators and victims. And I just thought, yeah, well, that's really telling that the first person on your mind, I mean, I'm not really, I don't, anyway, whether it was just by fluke, but anyway, the first person who gets mentioned is the perpetrator. Um, and to me, it is, yeah, the idea that a, an app could be useful just feels very connected to the idea that you want to protect perpetrators because how could you just imagine that someone's put their code into an app or done whatever it is oh that means that whatever happens after this it's all agreed to um i, I mean i think it's laughable um and I, I did want to just actually go back to uh comments that jocelyn was making a moment ago about um fitness to hold office and uh, free, like political speech and, um, and allegations. The Attorney General, let's just say in general terms, the, the, the Attorney, well, just very recently, there was law put in place about family law. So the family law as a freestanding, um, you know, the freestanding, sorry, the freestanding family court was, um, has just been abolished. And this is something that was pushed forward by the Attorney General is it too much to imagine that the fitness of um, the Attorney General to to make a decision about something that you know profoundly affects women um, that that's called into que question by by someone against whom uh, allegations of a sexual nature um, of, of misconduct have been raised? And I think um, just more more generally, it's definitely clear that the you know, holders of high public office need to be held to a higher standard of um, uh, than you know of accountability than um, than other people. So, in in the question of um, you know as far as the allegations that have recently been made, um, the presumption of innocence and um, the rule of law in that sense of presumption of innocence that's that's not that's not kind of being raised by calling for a, a, an inquiry. Um, whether whether someone has committed a crime, that's that's not going to be that's not going to be that's not going to be interrogated. I mean, it's that the possibility for that has has gone, and and so uh, so that's that's not the question. But is um, is this person fit to hold public office? And I'd just say that I, that um, I, I can't see how a um, a defamation case is what's going to is what's going to establish whether or not. A person has got the confidence of the community to hold their office. I think they're different questions, um, uh, and I do definitely think that the um, the you know defamation, like throwing out a, a defamation case, you know, at least potentially has uh, negative implications for for the willingness of um, commentators to, d to discuss these matters. And, and I think, I mean, I, I t definitely noticed as someone, like I went to the Mianjin Brisbane uh, rally on Monday, and one of the very, very popular chants was actually that Christian Porter has to go. And it comes to the political question of, is this person, is this someone who, you know, is seen to be above reproach, um, whether or not he's above reproach, <laughs> he's got to be seen to be above reproach, um, has got to be seen as someone who we can have confidence in you know, understands the seriousness of of, um, of these questions, and so it's, it's the confidence of the community that is um, that is at question. Um, and and I noticed that uh, that in the reporting that I saw that night and the next couple of days, um, the call for Christian Porter's um, resignation or to be stood down, it didn't feature in the reporting on the rallies, even though it was a huge feature of the rally that I attended. Um, I want to turn to you, Jocelyn, and I guess discussing the question of uh, rape and sexual assault and how the legal system deals with that. To me, I think, I mean, and I guess I'm especially asking your, your opinion in general as a feminist lawyer, it seems to me very apparent that the legal system is not very good at dealing with these questions. When you look at the figures of the estimates of the number of assaults that take place, um, the number of reported is very small, the proportion that are prosecuted is small again, the proportion where the prosecutions are successful is also, you know, is, is even smaller again. 
Uh, so it feels to me, it doesn't feel controversial to say that the current legal setup is not adequate for protecting the rights of, of women or victims who are you know, victims of these sort of crimes. So I'm wondering, Jocelyn, if you've got any comments about um, how the legal system currently does deal with these questions of rape and sexual assault and, and what improvements could be made to, to make that better? Um, well, women have been concerned about this issue for centuries. There's no question. It's not a new thing. And at the end of the 19th century, women were concerned about rape in marriage, for example. And um, so and we come forward into the 1970s and 80s when the women's movement was absolutely hot on this issue. And I, together with two colleagues, drew up the well-draft bill on sexual and uh, on rape and other sexual offences. And that became, a, a, how can I put it, a, a basis for changes to the law in New South Wales that was considered in the Northern Territory. All around Australia it had an impact in Aotearoa, New Zealand, in the United Kingdom, in Canada, in Fiji, and so on. But we're still in the same position of the issues that are being raised now are the issues that were raised back in the 19th century. One point that's not commented on sufficiently, I think, is this, the, the time frame that it takes for rape cases to go through. There have been efforts to have speedy trials when rape um, is the is the crime that's uh, being prosecuted. But I was just reading Chantelle Miller's book, Know My Name. She's the woman who was raped by the guy at Stanford who got six months or some ludicrous sentence because he was a, a Olympic style swimmer. And it's really, it's such a good book to read because amongst other things she goes into the huge delay her sister had to be a witness her sister was at university doing exams the case would be coming on and her exams were just in train and then no the case was adjourned and so on so we have to pay attention to that too because that is really debilitating if somebody's going through the court process and of course I'm a, a barrister and I know all this and yet reading this book brought it home so solidly to me in terms of that ludicrous proposition about the app, I mean, of course, I agree with Carmela. It's, 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 it's foolish because um, the cases now do hold that consent can be withheld even when the, uh, you know, in the case of penetration, which is the way that rape is defined, that even if the penis is penetrating the vagina, the woman can then withdraw her consent and the withdrawal of her consent can be considered as a, a valid lack of consent and therefore the man could be convicted of, of, of rape. So, yes, at what point are you going to actually exercise your right to, to um, imprint your consent on this app? Um, I think the police uh, commissioner did admit that it was something that could be considered to be foolish. I think we need to relook at this whole area yet again. But one of the problems is the judges and it's the barristers, and they really have to take responsibility for their conduct. The prosecutors who do not pick up on issues that on the conduct of the other side and do not object judges who allow um things to go through to the keeper that shouldn't when the defense counsel is questioning in a harassing manner or, or raising questions that are really irrelevant and that's still going on it's still going on uh, louise milligan's book um, witness is, is testament to that and other people who've done research into it. But uh, I should say I did uh, my um, first doctoral thesis was on um, uh, uh, substantive and evidentiary issues of consent in rape. And what I'm doing now is I'm revisiting that thesis, which was written in uh, the 70s. I got my doctorate in 78, 79 and in on that topic, that doctorate. And I think that it's time to revisit this. But in revisiting it, one does need to go back to the history because the history infuses the present. And this is the problem that we change the law. We say we're reforming it. But the problem is that the judges who are putting that law into effect and the defence counsel and the prosecutors who are putting that law into effect did not learn that law. When they were at law school, there was another law before that reform. And so the problem is that the old law comes back 
through the back door of the new law because you've got people putting the law into effect who have not been trained in what the new law is about. And they're coming with their brains that were in operation at law school and they're at now applying that brain to a new law. And unfortunately, too often, they revert to type in terms of what their old training was. And I think that's a very real problem here. That's why in the draft bill on rape and other sexual offences that Kerry Hubell, Di Graham and I did for the women's electoral lobby, um, that's why that bill said bringing in a new law requires to have as a part of that law a, a, a compulsory obligation on anyone who is in practicing in that field and any judge who is uh, operating in that field to undergo a retraining process. What we have to do is wrench their brains about so that they can come into the 21st century and actually realize what the realities of rape are. And the final point I'll make about this, anybody who starts talking about false complaints should can start talking about false complaints of robbery, false complaints of theft, false complaints of um, assault and so on, because the statistics on false complaints are about 6% at maximum and it's across the board. It's not just in relation to sexual offences. Of course, there are some false complaints there, but that there are no more false complaints there than men making false complaints that they were robbed on the way home and that's why they don't have any money to their wife, you know, for the groceries and so on, because they've spent the money at the pub or they've spent the money on the horses and they're telling great big whoppers. And men are just as likely to be making false complaints about this, that and the other thing as women might be. And the numbers are minimal, both for women and men, in terms of false complaints in the criminal justice system. I think the legal system is very good at you know, pro making professions about guilt or innocence and then finding people or locking people up. But I guess we're living at a time when the, uh, the decarceration movement is, uh, is getting stronger. There's a big movement in the United States for defund the police, abolish the police. Do you have any comments you want to make in relation to rape and sexual assault and in particular restorative justice and these questions in relation to rape and sexual assault? I think I think the police question is problematic because when they talk about defund the police, I don't think they are saying abolish police forces. Well, wait, they're saying abolish police forces, but retain police service. Now, John Avery, who was the police commissioner in New South Wales some decades ago, had this approach that we're a service not a force and he ran the service in that way and I think we have to reorientate police services. Uh -huh. The scenes on Clapham Common were shocking and I cannot believe that a police force was so absolutely even lacking in PR that when women are demonstrating peacefully about the fact that a woman had been allegedly murdered and the alleged perpetrator, the man who was being held in prison, was a police officer. So you've got police officers coming out and visibly, in my opinion at least, assaulting women who were simply saying, we have a right to walk on the streets at night, at day, at any time, and not to be subjected to assault. And here are the police in my view, so I looked at it and it seemed apparent to me that there were assaults going on and it wasn't the women assaulting the police, it was the opposite way around. But I think, I think that, so I think there we need to reorientate the police as well. I think we need a decent police force, but when there are complaints against the police, they have to be dealt with externally. They can't be dealt with internally. In this country, um, every complaint over a particular period that related to race discrimination was simply, uh, you know, wasn't taken seriously. They weren't proceeded with, they were dismissed. And we can't have that because it's nonsense to suggest that there's no sexism, there's no racism, etc. in the police force. There's racism and sexism in the world and no institution is immune from it. 
And I suppose to come back to the final point about our parliaments, I mean, it's rampant in our parliaments. And why wouldn't it be? Because our parliaments are representative of particular power groupings within the world. And that's why the levels of sexual harassment and abuse are as high as they are. I mean, in, I can just testify to the fact that, um, in my opinion, in my opinion, uh, women are subjected to bullying and abuse in the political arena. And there's no question about that. So that if women are subjected to bullying and abuse in the political arena, where laws are made, and where we're supposed to be able to find that uh, this institution will make our society run effectively, of course people are upset and concerned. I do hasten to add, though, I believe absolutely in uh, democracy, I believe absolutely in parliaments, and I think that if we didn't have parliaments, we'd be in a very poor state, worse than we are. We just have to make sure that they operate in a way that is fair and just and according to the rule of law. That's where the rule of law needs to be applied in the parliaments of this, of this country, the United Kingdom, and in Australia. Rule of law also should be the subject of some information and training, at least to the Prime Minister of Australia and to others in Australia who are pronouncing upon the rule of law in a way that is not consistent with what the rule of law is at all. Back to school. Back to school, every one of you. Thank you very much, Jocelyn. Uh, so, Kamala, we'll turn to you now. Uh, how do you, what comments do you want to make about how the legal system should deal with uh, rape and sexual assault? Well, I think um, just following on from what Jocelyn said, there's a lot, uh, a lot of change that could be made just at the level of retraining judges, um, having uh, clear consent in the legal system about well, what does constitute consent and, and so forth. Um, also, the, those those processes that that Jocelyn alluded to of, of not um, you know not making it so hard. But I, th I think at the core of it, there are a couple of things. There's there's also just just the question of in society as a whole having a a clearer understanding of of the importance of believing women. And I think I, I actually think that one of the huge things that is going on now is this movement. To be, for with this slogan, believe women. I think it's it's potentially incredibly powerful because if if at the level of the the judges, the police, if the kind of gut feeling is, oh, she was asking for it, or oh, you know, it, she's probably not telling the truth. You know, if if there if there remains that assumption, kind of woven through the institutions of power, um, then then those unconscious biases will be there. So we can reform the laws and, and have, you know, formal training. But eat, but I think the loudest voice is, is coming from women as a whole saying, you've just got to believe us. You know, when we say this happened, you've got to believe us. And I, I think that the likelihood that that's going to um, be, I, I think that that's got a very powerful potential role to play in, in this kind of revolutionary movement of, of, of trying to change our institutions uh, across the board. Um, and I, I think that we probably need to look at other solutions than just the criminal justice system because they, I mean, uh, Jocelyn knows a lot more about evidentiary principles than I'm ever going to, but um, I, we all can understand that there's a, someone has to be presumed innocent um, until proven guilty. And there is a conflict between that and a basic general assumption that we're going to believe women. And in the criminal system where you're going to take away someone's freedom potentially uh, if you can prove you know beyond reasonable doubt that they've committed rape um, you do need to have a high level of proof and so you do have to have um, you know the, the case has to be argued and, and, and so forth but surely we can also have some other complementary system where criminal liability might not be um, might not be established but where there can be repercussions, where there can be some form of accounting, holding to account, uh, that can mean things like, well, you don't get to occupy a position of power. You don't get to be a spokesperson for an organisation. You, you don't get to uh, basically cash in on or, um, or otherwise benefit from abuses of power. 
uh, and and where we can say, well, look, it doesn't have to be, you know, the burden of proof doesn't have to be as high because the consequence isn't as high, but it's still real. And I think what a lot of women, uh, you know, a lot of women do face the, all these hurdles and the, the horror of the thought of going to court um, and arguing their case and being ripped to shreds. So yes, the, the ripping to shreds has to stop, but we probably need some kind of a parallel system where there's still some version of accountability uh, that can satisfy women's need for justice. Uh, because at the moment, especially especially what's going on in, in Parliament now, well, if it's, it can't go to a you know criminal proceeding, well, what are we left with? Oh, not my problem, says the Prime Minister, basically. Uh, and uh, so, so I think there need to be these these um, parallel mechanisms. And I'm thinking also of the kind of parallel mechanisms that um, are being experimented with and established actually in in the Kurdish led revolution in northern Syria, which I think can teach us more, and I'll happily talk about that in a sec if you if you um, want to go down that path. Well, I think actually it would be good to talk about the, the question of restorative justice and the current demands, defund the police, etc. Uh, and I guess in particular, the criminal justice system is very much focused on finding a punishment or whatever after a crime has been committed. Surely one thing we also need to talk about is how do we actually prevent this crime from happening in the first place? Yeah, this is a, these are very important questions and I think that I think I really welcome the opportunity to talk about them. So, because it's it's true what we, I mean, I, th I think one of the things about lock them up and chuck them away for good has in mind that there are people who are just beyond any form of capacity to change. And that is definitely true of some people. And there's, there's, there's definitely a role of keeping the community safe by locking up people who are unable to safely live with the rest of us. Um, uh, that should be done humanely and every effort should be made to rehabilitate people. And there are some great programs in parts of the world like Scandinavia, where the way people are treated in prison is very humane. Their liberty is gone, but they've got other, you know, but but other freedoms or other rights aren't denied, and they have very low recidivism rate. So, so there's just treat people humanely in jail, but be, beyond that, trying to find a way forward. And in the Kurdish system, which I'll describe in a sec, but in the Kurdish system, they talk about uh, as a as a general thing, they talk about people who have been harmed and people who have harmed. So they don't use this kind of language of criminalisation as if it's something essential about people, but they leave open the possibility that people can be restored to safely and, and um, conscientiously occupying a place in a society. So it doesn't just damn everyone who has ever done something that's harmed another person, but actually tries to find a path that the person who has been harmed can um, not just live with, but can uh, can be vindicated, can be um, restored themselves to their sense of safety and their their sense of well-being and protection by the community that has let them down by the bad thing having happened, um, and on the other hand, of the person who was harmed somehow contributing to restoring that other person's well-being, somehow contributing to um, to being restored to a standing in the community that's not just behind closed doors, behind, sorry, behind bars and, um, and uh, with no possibility of, of reintegration. And the way that they've done it in this revolutionary moment, and I think we need to be thinking about revolutionising everything, and one of the things that the Kurdish-led revolutionary movement in northern Syria has done, they've, they've set up parallel women-led institutions and women-only institutions in every part of society. So it's the education system, it's journalism, it's the trade unions, it's the cooperative movement, it's the healthcare. So, the, so across the board, they've set up uh, in parallel to the mixed institutions and, and the, the, you know, the, the councils that make other decision-making bodies, you know, have women and men in them. Um, but in parallel to all those aspects of society, from decision making through to civil society, how, how people live, parallel women only institutions. And so in the judicial system, in the justice system, there is a parallel 
women's only uh, women's only tribunals. Now, the very serious, the most serious crimes are still tried in the the court system with um, judges who are trained in the law. But many of the conflicts in society, many of the complaints are able to, to go to courts and anything that affects women goes before women. And I think that that has a huge potential to institutionalise the idea that we believe women, uh, as well as to, to bring what we're, yeah, to, to bring a restoration. Uh, and in a society where rape culture is still prevalent, even though we're having this wonderful moment uh, where, where rape culture is still prevalent, where the, Failing to uh, failing to believe women is still prevalent. Uh, institutionalising women's led and women's only, uh, you know, organisations, I think is at least something that we need to examine. I'm, I'm not saying that we're going to we we have to do it, but I think we need to look at it and see what can we get out of it, you know, for an Australian context. Um, certainly trying to devolve things to local community participation is a critical part of it because it's, I mean, our feminism has to break down all the barriers, all the glass ceilings. It has to establish a new way of looking at women, a new way of our relating to each other. But I think it's part of what it's got to do. It's It's got to also deconstruct these quite alien and alienating institutions that aren't good for men either, actually. Like the majority of men who go to court, the majority of working class men, the majority of indigenous people, the majority of people of colour, the majority of women, the majority of us <laughs> who go to a court find it quite an alienating, freaky, scary kind of experience. What if we did have local, more devolved community control with principles that we adhere to? And it'd have to be definitely in the context of a society that's on the move. Uh, in all sorts of areas uh, that that's moving towards trying to find justice across the board, including and importantly justice for women. So that's I mean I think we should be having a conversation that goes in that direction. How can we have a more radical justice system as well as um, changing, transforming everything that we need to in society? And that gets to the the other aspect of your question about prevention, because um, and and linked to defunding the police is revolutionising our security. And that's one of the things that's happened in the uh, Roja revolution in northern Syria, has been a transformation from old policing forces, um, old police forces, to new community-based policing services where people know who's on their community uh, patrol and but they rotate who does it. And so the, this idea of a, I mean, we used to call it um, years ago, I'll get to it, community self-policing. And, and I think they're, they're experimenting with that in this revolutionary moment in Rojava. Um, and so, yeah, defunding the old police service that is racist, it's sexist, um, it's, it's permeated with, um, and it's, it's definitely, you know, plays a role in, in oppressive class relations as well. Like there's all these things that are wrong with the, the way our existing police forces are, you know, are basically support the status quo, support the, the positions of power, um, whether it's um, racial or, or gendered or, or class-based. And so, yeah, let's have something that um, actually moves to uh, a new form of policing where the community's involved. Um, and then the, the further step is just not waiting till bad things happen, but proactively, uh, proactively working on respect in every area of our lives. And we do have to revolutionise every institution. And I think the fact that at the same time that the parliament has been dealing with allegations of rape and sexual harassment, uh, at the same time also coming forward have been the revelations about the way young women are assaulted and harassed in schools. And this is an echo of the the young women who came forward in the universities uh, so, several years ago to, to point to the culture of toxic, toxic masculinity on university campuses. And, and even just in the last week, uh, just the New South Wales Rural Fire Service. So, it's, it, I mean, I think we over the coming weeks, I hope that more and more women 
see that this is our moment and stand up and uh, speak up about other institutions. Oh, I'm a doctor and I forgot to mention the medicine as an institution. Like there are just so many uh, of these institutions. So, um, so we need to like put the microscope, um, put under the microscope all the institutions and uh, in our education, across the um, mass media, uh, across everything, be starting to put forward images and have conversations about what it means to respect women, including in that, of course, what consent really looks like and uh, and just trying to find, you know build um, build those individual forms of responsibility as well as the structural change that needs to happen. Thanks everybody for that. Thanks to Jocelyn Scutt and to Kamala Emanuel for joining us here today. Thanks everybody for for watching this video and or listening on podcast. Uh, obviously, we can. This is available on on video on uh, on YouTube. It's also available on podcasts. You can find it all at the Green Left website, greenleft.org.au. But if you're getting this podcast on Apple Podcasts or whatever else, we'd love to get a review or comment, thumbs up on you on the video or, or wherever you're seeing this video, wherever you're seeing this uh, this show, please give it a thumbs up. And if you're in a position to become a Green Left supporter, as I said, the links in the description. We'd love to we'd love to have your support. Thanks everybody for joining us. Thank <laughs> you.